plague is an issue in uh, wild animals as well. So sylvatic plague um, is really how plague maintains itself in the southwestern United States. And, in, and sylvatic refers to a disease of wild animals. Um, here you can see plague occurring in wild rodents, so squirrels, uh, prairie dogs, and wood rats. Um, we have transmission of the organism between individuals, um, as well as through vectors, so particularly fleas. Periodically, we get spillover either into humans or into one of our domestic species. So people can become infected when they're bitten by one of those fleas um, as an incidental host. And animals can become infected when, for instance, a cat eats a wild rodent that's infected with plague. We also have to be aware that these uh, fleas on our wild rodents will happily move on to our domestic species, um, potentially providing another opportunity for transmission. So having the dog sleep in bed with you, its fleas jump off onto you, and plague can be transmitted in that way. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control has some excellent information on their website about sylvatic plague and the ecology of this organism in the United States. So like I said, sylvatic plague um, occurs as a cycle between wild rodents and fleas. Prairie dogs are actually highly, highly susceptible. And uh, sylvatic plague actually threatens um, some of our ecosystems, including here in Canada. The black-tailed prairie dog is um, at risk of extinction due to habitat, habitat loss. And this is exacerbated uh, by the presence of sylvatic plague in certain populations. I've put a link to a video above that describes a project in the United States trying to combat sylvatic plague in some of these animal populations. These wild rodents can serve as a source of plague for domestic species, including cats and dogs, who, like I said, can get sick if they eat an infected rodent or are bitten by a flea. And in cats, this is potentially a very, very serious infection. So just like in people, plague occurs in three forms. There's bubonic plague, where we see lymphadenomegaly, um, often the submandibular lymph nodes. And this is associated with eating infected rodents. They're eating the infected tissue. The organism gets into the body uh, through the mouth and affects those most proximal lymph nodes. It's important to know that this may just look like abscesses. So you have outdoor cats who are potentially fighting. It could be difficult to distinguish. Septicemic plague may or may not follow the bubonic form and is associated with hematogenous dissemination. So the bacteria makes its way into the bloodstream and we see rapid progression to death within one to two days. And then finally, we have pneumonic plague. Um, this may follow hematogenous dissemination, so if you get the organism settling out in the lungs, or it may be due to inhaling infectious droplets. This disease is a serious, serious zoonotic risk. While it may not be terribly common, this is one that you as future veterinarians absolutely need to be aware of. Um, cats who have pneumonic plague um, that may be expiring the organism or uh, breathing it out when they hiss at you, present a very, very serious threat uh, to people who are in their proximity. If you were to breathe in those infectious droplets, you could develop pneumonic plague yourself, which is rapidly fatal. So if you're living in or practicing in an endemic region, beware the hissing cat. In dogs, plague is much less likely to manifest as clinical disease. Most commonly, we see no clinical signs at all. If we do have clinical disease, the treatment of choice is streptomycin, although doxycycline, gentamicin, and chloramphenicol are also reasonable choices. Typically, we start with parenteral antibiotics, um, so giving something IV, and then switch to oral with improvement. This is a, a 2014 study from JAVMA, which describes the clinical signs present in dogs who were diagnosed with plague. So what I think is really important to point out here is that these are animals who were diagnosed. Many, many more dogs will have had clinically inapparent disease. And so this is a biased population that may not reflect the presentation of plague in dogs overall. Having said that, of these 62 cases, 100% of them were febrile, they were lethargic, and many of them were also anorexic. So if you're living in an endemic region, 
you may need to consider this as a possible differential uh, for febrile and lethargic animals. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis most often causes a sporadic disease, um, so we don't necessarily see big outbreaks. And in those affected animals, we typically see abscessation of the internal organs. Um, it's found in the intestine, and it can also cause enteric infections in a variety of species, so mammals, birds, and possibly also humans. In ruminants, we see enteric diseases under stressful conditions, so diarrhea when we have cold, wet weather, a poor diet, um, and potentially also when we have stressful manipulations. So particularly in really flighty species like our farmed deer, um, they're more prone to these infections. In cattle and sheep, uh, abortion is also a possible manifestation. This causes pseudotuberculosis in guinea pigs, which occurs in two forms. There's a septicemic form, and then we see uh, more focal infections, so nodules in internal organs. Um, here you can see uh, the liver of a rabbit. We have necrotizing hepatitis caused by Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and I think you can appreciate all of these uh, multifocal uh, to coalescing white nodules, which are these abscessations. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is also reported to cause septicemia in a wide variety of species. Yersinia enterocolitica is primarily an enteric pathogen of people, and it's associated with eating undercooked pork. Um, the CDC estimates that there's around 117,000 cases annually, and these are often associated with specialty food products like chitlins, which are pork intestine, that are prepared improperly. Symptoms of these infections vary with age. Um, in younger children, we see fever, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, which may be bloody. And in older children and adults, uh, fever and abdominal pain, which can actually mimic appendicitis, is recognized. Systemic infections can occur and is associated with iron overload, and so frequently these people are also treated with iron chelating agents. Rarely, Yersinia enterocolitica has also been associated with enteric diseases in ruminants. Finally, Yersinia ruckeri. Um, this is an important pathogen of farmed fish. So rainbow trout, one of our salmonids, which are really widely farmed, are very, very susceptible. These infections most often affect fry and fingerling fish, so the little guys. And what we see is a low level of mortality that persists. And so over time, we ultimately end up with large losses. In affected fish, we see behavioral changes, so they may be swimming near the surface and have a loss of appetite. And subcutaneous hemorrhages uh, are also oftentimes seen. Subcutaneous hemorrhaging is a great sign for sepsis in our aquatic species, and postmortem investigation of these infections oftentimes reveals septicemia. In this image here, you can see a rainbow trout with severe skin lesions. We have cutaneous depigmentation and a really nasty cellulitis um, associated with Yersinia ruckeri. Today, we've by no means discussed the entire breadth of Enterobacteriales. There are many other organisms which cause a wide variety of opportunistic infections in many other species. So don't be surprised when you find them from mastitis, abortions, UTIs, diarrhea, sepsis. It's important to be familiar with the most common genera in this order so that you'll have some idea of what you're treating. Importantly, the Enterobacteriales share a lot of therapeutic and resistance issues, which we'll talk about uh, with intrinsic resistance in a few slides. In this image here, you can see uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae on urine cytology from a dog, so a common cause of urinary tract infections that clinically is going to be very similar to a UTI caused by E. coli. As far as samples to collect, um, in cases of salmonellosis, uh, feces, blood for serology, if we have dead animals, um, collecting affected tissues, so abortuses, placentas, abdominal viscera, or samples from long bones if we suspect septicemia. If you suspect Yersinia pestis, you must handle your samples with extreme caution. Personal protective equipment is essential. This would include gloves, probably an N95 mask, eye protection. Um, you're going to want to collect lymph nodes, aspirates, any edematous tissue, and blood. 
Um, you're going to need to do all of this using maximal sharps precautions. You absolutely do not want to cut yourself while working with or handling these tissues. And I know I've mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but recapping needles is an absolute no-no. This is a very hazardous practice, which puts you at an unacceptable level of risk. For other Yersinia, you can collect affected tissues, so lymph nodes, blood, feces, and for the rest of the order, it's really going to depend on where your infection is. So use your best judgment as a clinician. And of course, we don't want to freeze our samples. In the lab, salmonella can be identified through culture. Um, oftentimes, selective media is employed. So if this is a bug you suspect, make sure to tell the lab so they can use the appropriate uh, media. We also have serological assays to detect uh, exposure to this organism. We have media for the selective isolation of Yersinia, and it's important to make sure that the lab knows what species you're dealing with. When dealing with infections in ectothermic animals, so perhaps a, a fish farm with rainbow trout, um, it's important to let the lab know what species you're dealing with so that they can modify the incubation temperatures. For other Enterobacteriales, generally speaking, they will readily grow on sort of standard culture media, so blood and McConkie. Organisms within this order can be identified based on their colony morphology, biochemical tests, uh, potentially serology or Malditoff. In outbreak settings, it may be important to uh, employ DNA fingerprinting techniques to determine what the source of the infection was. If you find yourself in this situation, I would strongly encourage you to talk to the lab about what the best diagnostic strategy is for identifying the source. As an order, the Enterobacteriales can be quite promiscuous. They're found kind of anywhere and everywhere. And in my opinion, transmission between species is probably under-recognized. Transmission of organisms where there isn't really a red flag, um, like E. coli between people and companion animals, is probably just not recognized. If we're dealing with plague, Definitely, public health officials are going to zero in on that. But many of these bacteria are far more mundane, and, and probably there's transmission going on that's sort of flying under the radar. Because we do have some important zoonotic pathogens, especially Yersinia pestis, you need to know what's common in your area of practice. So I would recommend checking out websites like ProMed Mail, which serve as an early warning system for reporting uh, emerging diseases and potential zoonoses. Generally speaking, salmonella should be considered zoonotic. Um, some serotypes are definitely more pathogenic in humans than others, but all of them should be handled with caution. Transmission can be either foodborne or through contact with infected or colonized animals. Um, petting zoos are an important source of salmonella, so whether that's poultry, pigs, horses. Um, there have been reports of people getting infections um, after uh, interacting with and, and exploring owl pellet. Reptiles are often thought of as a, a source of salmonella, but one perhaps underappreciated reservoir are actually the feeder mice that the reptiles eat. These have also been implicated in large outbreaks. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight uh, pet hedgehogs. Um, these are also recognized to be a, a common source of salmonella. And because we don't associate them with this pathogen, perhaps in the same way that we would reptiles, people may not use the same uh, hand hygiene practices um, that they would when handling a snake. And so there's certainly a risk there as well. For your cinea pestis, you need to be aware of exudates, so ruptured lymph nodes. Respiratory droplets, this is a major one. Beware the hissing cat in endemic areas and fleas as well. This is a very diverse group of organisms, and treatment really needs to be based on susceptibility testing. We have a lot of emerging resistance in this uh, order, and there's some very uh, high impact resistance mechanisms that you need to be aware of. So specifically, we have broad spectrum beta-lactamases, so degradative enzymes that can break down our beta-lactam type drugs, our penicillins, cephalosporins, and even carbapenems. So the ESBLs or extended spectrum beta-lactamases and a number of carbapenemases like NDM and KPC. We also see the emergence of fluoroquinolone resistance and enterobacteriales are notorious for possessing mobile genetic elements or plasmids, which have multiple resistance genes on them. 
We also have a lot of intrinsic resistance within this order, and it varies widely by genus and species. So a species level ID is really important in therapeutic selection. Here we've got some tables from UCAST, and among the entire order, so all of our Enterobacteriales and also Aeromonas, we see intrinsic resistance. So this is normal, this is expected um, to benzyl penicillin, our original penicillin, glycopeptides, lipoglycopeptides, fusidic acid, most of our macrolides, lincosamides, streptogramins, rifampin, and the oxysalidinones. Within the order, you can see some interesting species-specific differences as well. So our Enterobacter cloacae complex, for instance, is intrinsically resistant to ampicillin amoxicillin, our potentiated penicillin, so amoxclav and ampicillobactam, as well as many of our cephalosporins and cephamycins. So having a species level ID allows you to rationally select an empiric therapy while waiting for your susceptibility test results. You know that all of these drugs should be avoided. And then here we've got uh, just the remainder uh, of, of organisms in our UCAST table. The spice bacteria is one group that I think you should remember. It's a nice mnemonic. So spice stands for serratia, providentia, indole positive protease, which is Proteus vulgaris and Morganella, Citrobacter and Enterobacter. These organisms are intrinsic producers of AMP-C beta-lactamases. So AMP-C beta-lactamases are some particular types of degradative enzymes that cannot be inhibited with beta-lactamase inhibitors. So clavulanic acid will not help you. It will not restore susceptibility. And these organisms should be considered to be intrinsically resistant to the third generation cephalosporins. So in a veterinary context, if you're dealing with a spice organism, I would recommend avoiding all beta-lactams. We have quite a few new terms today, and then of course, a few questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.